three o'clock uh, start. Joy has currently started the, the recording. So um, I'll, pass, um, I'll pass over to my, my colleague, Alfredo Solero, who is an Eden senior fellow, participates in many different uh, um, groups within the organization, and he's also a full professor of engineering at the, the University of Porto in, in Portugal. So, um, Alfredo, let's switch over to your presentation, and we'll, we'll let you get on with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I'm very glad that uh, we had this uh, discussion about this important topic of uh, uh, social engagement and uh, uh, civic um, education. But what I'm going to, to present is something that I've worked for some time with, um, uh, for those who know, the Tuning Academy within a project that was called um, the Calohi. And uh, the point is that uh, we would like to have a list of uh, competences within, the, um, within the, 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 this subject, a list of competences that could uh, somehow define what type of uh, education and training we could provide or we could attend to acquire these competences that are more and more necessary in the current times. So this is what I'll talk. I'll, I will try to be brief. Uh, I was at a <clears throat> webinar at noon and, uh, oh, sorry, at one o'clock, uh, noon over here. And the point is that uh, we, we don't have time. So I would like to have more time for questions. So I'll try to be brief. You have the presentation afterwards and I'll be available. For, them, for any questions you, 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 you have. But um, like I mentioned, you have this website where you can, um, you can find more information about uh, Calohi. Calohi is a, a framework uh, that got two additional uh, extensions to uh, define um, uh, frameworks in five subject areas together with forms of assessment uh, and of teaching and learning. Um, there are two uh, follow-up uh, projects that have been approved also by the European Commission. They started uh, this year, and you will probably hear more about it. But within this one that ended last year, um, what I want to talk is about uh, these um, four dimensions of the framework that have been identified by the group and were used uh, to define the competences in uh, five um, areas, uh, physics, teacher education, uh, uh, history, um, nursing, and civil engineering. That's where I got in, in the civil engineering area. And um, for these uh, dimensions, we uh, also identify the descriptors. So that's what I'll show you quickly. Um, of course, uh, the descriptors have um, uh, the three dimensions of the European Qualification Framework, knowledge, skills, autonomy, and responsibility. I like to call it attitudes, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, others would like to, to, to call it, uh, I mean, the European Commission prefers autonomy and responsibility. Of course, the descriptors can be broken into sub-descriptors, and of course, the sub-descriptors have to be adapted to the academic level, uh, bachelor, master, uh, other types of higher education, continuing education, and of course to the education problem and to the uh, local or society rules because um, uh, what is neither is proper assessment. Um, the, the question of um, the, the, the assessment is very important because uh, if we want to be sure that our students and our learners have these competences, we have to assess them properly. So you will probably need the sub-descriptors to do that. And that's uh, what I'll uh, talk about. Um, uh, the four uh, aspects that were considered, like I mentioned, were societies and cultures. Uh, the question of interculturalism. I, 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 currently, as you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a big problem with this globalization. And uh, we need to uh, understand better and uh, to work with other cultures. Uh, the, the second one is um, 
what competences uh, people need uh, for the civic, social, and cultural engagement concerning uh, information and communication. People talk about fake news, they talk about uh, misinformation, propaganda, etc. But what competences do we need to address this question of analyzing information and communication? Now, the, the third one is about governance, about the participation all kinds of organizations from local to uh, national to global and of course the decision making. Decision making is something that uh, is affecting everyone and uh, we need the competences to do it uh, taking into account uh, what we're talking in this um, uh, webinar. And of course uh, the last aspect is the ethics, norms, values and professional standards. They are different. Um, ethics has been changing in history uh, and geographically. So we know we have different ethics, we have different norms, we have different values and professional standards. I, in my profession in engineering, we have uh, some strict uh, professional standards of other activities don't have it. And we need um, to define competences to address these issues. And like I said, this framework can be used as a standalone, there it is, uh, you have to do it, or adapted and incorporated in the subject area and uh, uh, let's say find the right, uh, the right um, competences uh, concerning the, 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 the program or the, the context where we are using this framework. Um, starting with the first uh, dimension, the societies and cultures. Um, this is what uh, the knowledge that it's necessary in terms of competence. Uh, and uh, we use the strong words of uh, Bloom at all, you know. It's, it's something that was carefully defined so we can uh, somehow find um, ways of measuring this competence, assessing and measuring, so we can guarantee that uh, our students have um, sufficient knowledge, they have sufficient skills, to analyze issues uh, in and between societies and cultures, and also engagement so the, the, by developing scenarios and best practice of interaction between uh, uh, cultures, which is, which is not easy but necessary. Second um, dimension, the process of information and communication, uh, the knowledge, uh, the, the, the students or the learners, we have to teach them how to, they can critically understand the process of information and communication. They can have the skill to review and judge, and judge uh, the news use of sources, data, etc., transparency, experts. And then, of course, in terms of attitudes, uh, uh, the, the, the learner has to show active contribution to debates. Uh, using uh, reliable and justified data and information so uh, you have um, uh, a right um, participation in these debates. And the third one, in terms of governance and decision making, uh, the knowledge is required to understand the process of governance and decision making. I don't know how much you know, but uh, decision theory is something that it's uh, very elaborate and very uh, advanced uh, and uh, they, they have to, to, to take the right decisions with the right, uh, uh, let's say, data and uh, information from the previous process. Uh, for instance, in terms of skills, um, they can be uh, tested against uh, applying and supporting the governing principles and norms uh, in terms of transparency, accountability, etc., democracy. And um, in terms of attitude, they have to demonstrate some active contribution uh, in, in the groups that are, they are inserted and, um, of course, uh, with respect to, to, to what are the norms and principles of the society or the organization they are working on. Um, the last one, in terms of ethics, uh, norms and values and professional standards, I teach ethics and uh, to my last year students and believe me it's not easy because there's generally a certain confusion between ethics, norms and professional standards and uh, ethics is something that it's really personal. 
So uh, the, 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 these uh, requirements in terms of competences uh, that we can teach or foster or examine uh, in terms of knowledge, what uh, it is recommended is that um, uh, students have to demonstrate critical understanding of the ethical principles. They have to have the skills to apply this process to decision making. And of course, um, they have to uh, be able to participate and promote and defend the ethics, norms and values and professional standards uh, applying it in what this framework is all about, which is governments, communication, and cultural interaction. And this is what I wanted to say. I don't have anything else except a thank you, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, somehow you can participate in the promotion of this type of framework within your uh, teaching and uh, activities and organizational activities, and um, thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Alfredo. I think that was uh, that was very interesting. Um, I see many advantages of um, of having a, a framework when it comes to actually formalising this this kind of process. I think it's particularly interesting, not just to our, our funding agencies and uh, the ATIs, the higher education institutions that are directly um, relating to our students, but also from the corporate world. I mean, you can see this in a way in, in a tangential aspect of the, the soft skills and the, and the importance that, uh, that the employers are giving to this. I think they want our graduates not just to be good engineers, they want them to be good, good people, if you want, like, good soft horizontal skills, and I see this kind of framework as, as being very important for that. So um, let's, uh, let's skip to the, uh, the chat, if that's okay. We've got a, an interesting question asked by um, Richard Powers, he says, this is very interesting. Alfredo, and says on, on slide four, point four about the ethics sum, how do you actually measure this active contribution? It's a very good question. Yeah, um, it is a good uh, point that if you go to slide, I don't, you'll, you'll be, uh, let me show you, um, I think I can go backwards, but um, the point is um, when you have the, the sub-descriptors, these are the descriptors, and when you have the sub-descriptors, which have the indicators, you can measure, because you can establish the sub-descriptors. For instance, uh, when I teach ethics, there are uh, three rules that I pass to the, the learners or the students about uh, uh, these ethics problems. And of course, these ethical problems never have just one solution, they have several uh, solutions and uh, uh, one of my descriptors are, are they able to apply those rules you see and that's how you assess it because the rules are very simple I mean one of them is whatever you do if it becomes public on the social media are you really going to do it if it's going to be public so that's one of the rules but there are others and uh, the other two I can, I can talk about it later um, but if they are able to apply this rule in the case, that is how I assess if they are uh, capable of looking at this, uh, uh, of this um, ethical studies. Um, there are discussions. You, you know the paper clip, right? The, the, the question of the, uh, if you are working and take a clip home from your university, is that acceptable or not? And then comes the the, the norms and the principles, which is one of the rules, and um, if they are able to understand and discuss and debate, that's, that's, that's enough, because at least raises the issues. Um, about uh, learning activities, yes, uh, the learning activities, if you go to them, and I'm answering to Richard Parrott, if you go to the site of the project, Calomy, they have not only the, 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 the uh, methods of assessment, but they also have learning activities. So I'm, I'm not going to explain, but uh, there, there are many, because these ethical rules were not just applied to engineering. I, I, I think I, don't, I didn't explain myself well, but they were not just ex used in engineering. They were used in nursing, they were used in, uh, in uh, physics, they were used in teacher training, they were used in history. And um, uh, so it is uh, something that it's uh, transversal, horizontal for all the subjects. Okay, last question. The survey, oh yeah, 
Um, oh, in open resources. Um, well, there is an open resource. There is a. Uh, I, I can email to you, uh, and I, or I can write uh, here um, a project where I participated many, many some years ago. I mean, time flies by quickly, and it has um, precisely open resources from guides to to manuals. Uh, that was called Pinter. It was coordinated by the UNED, you know, from Madrid in Spain. Teresa Aguado was the coordinator. And um, it has many open resources that you can use. You have manuals, very good manuals in several languages that probably you can use in your case. Is that okay? Yes, I think that's a, that's a great, um, a great answer. Alfredo, and thank you, Richard, for the questions. One thing I, I, I wonder, Alfredo, is um, it's interesting that your, your comment about the fact that you, you teach ethics to, to students in the later years of their degree. I mean, do you think we're going to have difficulties, if you like, activating the students, helping them to actually realize the value of being more, if you like, more active in these, in these sorts of competencies? Yeah, really. because I, when you're young and you go to university and you're studying, you're focused on the technical aspects, perhaps in engineering, and you're not aware of the broader... Yeah, let, let me tell you how I do it. In engineering, you take a lot of decisions, especially in my area, which is civil engineering. They affect people. One of them that I tell you, that I generally explain the problem is, for instance, you have a roundabout, and you can put uh, traffic lights, or you can put just a roundabout, or you can put bumps in the street, that costs money. But the effects are very different. And uh, when you show them that when you take this decision, it can save lives or not save lives, they understand the importance of ethics. And uh, because these are not professional standards. They, they, all the solutions technically are correct. But in terms of ethics, uh, they have consequences. People die. People get hurt. And um, this is how I think we can promote the, the conscience about ethics and norms and values, if we bring uh, the, the cases where the decisions imply uh, other people's lives and well-being. So that's how I do it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes, a, makes a lot of sense. I think it would be nice um, in the future to see this kind of framework being, being adopted by uh, um, degree program designers so we can actually begin to see the, the you know the explicit presence of these sorts of uh, of these you know, these structures in the in the courses I think they are very important and quite possibly in the in the medium term more important than a lot of the standard subjects that we, we teach on probably, on. probably. <laughs> yeah thank you very much um, if uh, anybody else has any other questions please feel free to um, ask them to Alfredo in the chat, and I think we'll we'll move on to our next uh, our next presenter now, and um, and we can come back to these uh, these issues at the at the end now. So, um, if uh, you can put your camera off, please, Alfredo. And then our next speaker is um, Diane Andoin, who's a Eden Vice President. She's also a full professor at the Polytechnic University of Timisoara Roma in the areas of multimedia and web technologies. Thank you, Diana. I'll pass over to you. Thank you very much, Timothy. I hope uh, everybody can hear me well. And uh, okay, so yes, I am Diana Andona. I'm coming from the Polytechnica University of Timisoara in the west part of Romania. And I would like to speak today about something that's a tiny bit different, also about active engagement, but this time about young people, students and high schoolers, which are trying and using, in fact, lots of technology to become more engaged, especially with culture and heritage. So that's uh, the main topic. And you have down there my Twitter ID, because in the next, in the previous session, that was one of the first questions which we were asked. So um, you can also tweet about this. And please use uh, Eden official Twitter also ID and open education with hashtag if you tweet about this uh, webinar. So I'm coming from the Polytechnic University of Timisoara. We are a 100 years university. We are celebrating our centennial this year. And uh, I'm uh, actually the manager of the e-learning center in this university, uh, working very hard on trying to promote uh, technology for education uh, and educators. 
I would like to speak about two projects. The first one is called Digital Culture, and it's mainly about uh, digital competencies and social inclusion for adults in creative industries. What are the creative industries? The creative industries are the industries which uh, incorporate culture, art, heritage, but also media, uh, press, advertising, even gaming, and some software development. So every, everywhere where creativity is the major, how to say, uh, product, product where you, can cre you cannot create, in fact, quite a lot of good, but you can create a lot of interesting things using your own creativity. And we were looking uh, a lot of universities around Europe and some companies and associations, including Eden, to how we can improve the, their digital competencies. And uh, the project uh, website is there, so you can have a look at some of the things which we already done. We are mainly trying to build up an online uh, course, free, obviously, available for everybody in uh, six different languages with uh, several courses dedicated to uh, digital competencies. We are looking at the digital competencies as they were defined by the European Union in the DICOM 2.1. For those which are not coming from Europe, in Europe we have defined about three years ago, four years ago, the digital competencies, and they are part of the official uh, curriculum vitae, which everybody now uh, uses, at least officially in Europe. And uh, we are part of the European education area, where one of the main initiatives and main targets uh, are for the next years and including this year, uh, how to improve the digital competencies of everybody. Because today we cannot use almost nothing and we cannot work without uh, technology. So you can find uh, soon the launch of the environment is ready. We have the course is almost finished and uh, we are looking forward for the beginning of April to start um, these courses. But um, the courses are very, very different. They are 12 courses at this moment. They are all coming and covering almost all the main subjects which uh, we were able to realize that they are interesting for the creative industries because we were running together with um, all the partners involved in the Digital Culture Project, a survey which uh, gather information for more than 30 countries about what people would like to know in terms of technology and especially how to apply that technology in, uh, in culture, heritage, in their creativity domain. And we need to say that uh, the communication management and also publishing and social media, but also how to build up your own website came on the top. So we are really focusing on those abilities and those competencies in our courses. And you will have lots of uh, applications and technologies presented in these courses. So join us. But the interesting bit about the active engagement is how part of this course content was produced. We took a different approach than probably the normal, let's say, massive and open online courses approach. We tried to focus a lot on using open education resources. We analyzed the open education resources and where we couldn't identify the best ones or the ones which were more um, let's say, adequate for our purpose and for our learning outcomes, we try to produce them and to invite artists, students, and freelancers to produce them together with us. So we actively engage, in fact, our target group in producing uh, content for our courses. And we managed to do that uh, with several students. We have at this moment, I'm speaking here from my university only, we have more than 60 open education resources produced by the students and the young artists, which incorporates different examples of technology, different examples of best practices, and different examples on how you can use technology, for example, I don't know, to manage a cultural project or to market a, a cultural project. And unfortunately, because all of them are in, based in videos mainly, we cannot really put them here, so I just had some uh, shots, some screenshots of them. So they are all, as you can see, developed with students under some uh, of some of our professors' supervision, but also by young artists, and they all have interesting uh, aspects and interesting uh, content uh, to be shown. 
what is proven uh, to us? This uh, has proven to us that we can really include students on creating content and make allow them to become creative creators. The creative creators, as Thomas Friedman has defined them about almost 10 years ago, which are the young people which are going really the extra mile to provide information and content and uh, how to make it more easier for people to um, provide information online. And here we have another example. This is an example using uh, virtual reality down and augmented reality on the top, where you can uh, see exactly some examples on how you can use augmented reality and virtual reality in uh, in culture. So how to present some uh, artistic or some sculptures. In this case, is a is a public art in one of the squares from from Timisoara. And you have also some hands-on in the courses on how to really uh, develop uh, this sort of uh, demos and applications using the very simple VR and AR tools. So the students are becoming creators. They learn how to do this on a specific topic. They do some research and analyze on that. They use different tools. They understand, obviously, the open education principles to some of them that was very new. They were not aware of them. They were not aware of the Creative Commons licenses. So this is really becoming uh, some uh, promotion which we are doing for the open education. And at the end, the resources are evaluated by their colleagues. So they also have quite a valuable feedback from their colleagues. Another project in which we use in a different way, a tiny different way, the uh, young uh, citizen uh, uh, engagement was what we call Spotlight Heritage uh, Timisoara. In the Spotlight Heritage Timisoara, we try to involve uh, young people together with uh, our university, with uh, museum and experts from the National Museum of History from our region in uh, Romania, and with the Timisoara 2021 European Capital of Culture, because our city next year is becoming the European Capital of Culture. So lots of interesting activities uh, building up. This, um, how to say, application and project involved different ideas. The main idea was that we wanted to be able to tell the stories of the digital and uh, of the uh, uh, digital stories of the cultural and heritage of uh, Timisoara, how the communities were developed, how uh, the technical development was in the city, and how the buildings uh, are um, existing, existing buildings, how they can say their stories. And we involved for these uh, different groups of students on trying to build up this digital story. So we have a website, a mobile application, an exhibition in, uh, in the museum, and also a street exhibition with some public points where with uh, tools as augmented reality, you were able to get some more information about those buildings, about the stories of the communities or the people which were living in that building or in the area uh, next to that building. The most important bit, which I try to focus here, is the young people's active engagement in reclaiming their uh, cultural heritage. That involves students and high schools, so people between 14 to 20 years old, uh, which visited the exhibition in guided tours. And the guides were also students. So we trained some of the students and high school uh, pupils on uh, becoming guides uh, for uh, the Spotlight Heritage and discovering the Timisoara by digital storytelling. And they really uh, love this. They use the mobile app. They use the uh, tools uh, which were available in the museum during the winter time. And they put a lot of stories and a lot of uh, information and, and uh, how to say, um, their own perspective on how uh, the city was. What was the result? The result was sorry. The result was that the students completely learned new things about their city. It's very very difficult today uh, to involve young people to learn something about the history, about old buildings, about uh, old people, or the the heritage or and the community of uh, your own even your own city. They are very reluctant on any information which you try to deliver about uh, history. So we try to use a lot of digital tools on engaging them. 
and we wanted to engage them by using their peers to engage them. So it's always much more easier for youngsters. Uh, a lot of research is saying this, is showing us this, that if you engage the youngsters, um, it's really, um, how to say, very powerful for young uh, people to understand and to uh, accommodate with this information. You can obviously uh, see my information here and you can get some more information about uh, what we are doing and the projects which we are doing uh, by following us on Twitter and uh, by going on our website. And I'll put immediately here the project websites where you can find some more information. And uh, let me use my last 30 seconds on inviting you to the Eden Annual Conference, which is happening in my city in a city which is going to be the European capital of culture. So you will be able to have hands-on experience on how to involve digital heritage and how to use digital storing for uh, for culture. So hopefully I'll see you next uh, June in, uh, in Timisoara. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Diana. That was a very impressive uh, present presentation. And I was completely overwhelmed by the number of projects. It's, uh, it's really quite... Uh, quite incredible. And um, I think you're completely spot on in, in the approach of, um, of trying to get younger younger people interested in different aspects of cultural heritage and part of their, of their history. I mean, I know from my own uh, children and children's friends and stuff, the difficulty it is to get, to get young people actually uh, motivated. And it, it's interesting from your comments, the um, the underlining mediating role that technology has in, in uh, in, in culture, and I think that's actually really, really, really good. Especially, uh, I like the the way you are related with virtual worlds because it, it might also be possible if we're talking about culturally uh, significant buildings to actually be able to, if you like, get somebody in there with their avatar, and then if you like, take the take them back in time, and they can see how things that we 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 assume as being normal were, were in fact different some some time ago. I mean. I've got a, a couple of questions. I'll ask you one to give our audience time to, to please don't be shy and ask us some, some questions on this, uh, this very impressive uh, work you've uh, you presented. I mean, you talk about the importance of student engagement. I mean, you want to get the younger, younger people actually involved. I mean, did you actually, if you like, reach out and contact them before you started to do the, the projects to try and find something that would be relevant for them? Or did you, I mean, how did you go about this whole engagement process, really, I guess is my question. Yeah, so basically, let's say about uh, popular heritage, because that's really with very young people. I mean, the youngest which were involved there was eight years old. So in fact, we contacted the schools and we uh, told the schools that we are doing this project and we let the schools to involve this. And to be honest, the the teachers from the professors from the schools were very reluctant. They said initially that they really don't expect that the students and the youngsters to be really very keen on uh, learning something about the heritage of our city, um, but we tried. And what was very surprising was that uh, the student clubs, so the clubs which the, the students have in the high schools, become very active. They really took it over. So in fact, we almost haven't done too much, <laughs> to be honest. We uh, just uh, showed to uh, some of the guides, as we said, about 10 of them, coming from different schools uh, from uh, from Timisoara area, the application, and especially the augmented uh, reality application, how you can use it and how it is. And we informed them, because we only took this year a neighborhood. I was very fast uh, going, very quick going over the slides. This is a four-year project. We take uh, each year a different neighborhood. Um, in this year is another neighborhood, a very, uh, an historical neighborhood of, of Timisoara, where we are going to present uh, the stories and, and the buildings and the fact about uh, that neighborhood. So it's really, how to say, a very popular for the students to use mobile phones, for example, to find out nothing. Uh, about anything, and we really push the the use of the mobile phones uh, for 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 this um, culture and heritage. So they use the mobile phones. They had a lot of videos and 360 photos about the buildings, about the inside of the buildings, 
old photos which we renderize and we make them in 3D. Uh, they had uh, the augmented reality so they can go in the location and, and point uh, the camera of their mobile phone towards the building and that more information and old photos of that building will pop in and they will see them and they really love it and um, was really um, not just loving it, it was really engaging for them to be able to, how to say, see the reaction to that information and to the stories about uh, the community which uh, lived in, in that area. So that was about the uh, total heritage and very briefly about the digital cultural. Uh, there was a bit different story. Uh, we have uh, used uh, students as uh, active creators of open education resources for the last three years in uh, in my in my group in my in my department, and uh, they quite like it. So, in fact, to be honest, the students ask about this because the students know one from each other about uh, what's happening uh, at certain courses, and they ask uh, when we are doing the the videos when we are we will be able to say something about what we want to do and what we want to do. So they, it's very easy to motivate sometimes and engage them. Even if I need to say that to develop a very good open education resources, which are stacks, images, uh, videos, and they respect all the, uh, the regulation about creative commons, about copyright and so on, it's not easy. But some of them were very, very impressive. We were very pleased with that. It's just uh, just incredible. I mean, for for people who are, are participating in this webinar and don't come from a technical background, perhaps they don't they don't realise quite the, the huge quantity of of, uh, of effort that's gone into these sorts of projects. And I really take my hat off to your to your engineers and, and, and technical people as well as the graphical designers. It's it's very good. Um, one thing I'd like to your... <laughs> You're very lucky because they hard to have a very good team these days. Yeah. I've got one question for you. Um, it's interesting when, we, when, when you're talking about social inclusion and I saw you're your following on comments. I understand you're referring to including younger people in the project because they're typically the people, if you like, who are not in their particular phase of life that interested in, in, in the wider aspects of culture and history. But um, how do you think we could also use this if you like to include, if you like, the people who've, uh, who've been left behind, because quite often you've got the older generations who actually know an awful lot about this historically, but because of the technology, they feel alienated. How do you think we could reach out to them and involve them in these sorts of projects? You are really spot on, Tim. That's one of the challenges which we have at this moment, because uh, with the exception probably of three or four stories, which were coming from quite, uh, let's say, uh, old people, they are over 85 and 90 years old, but which used their grandparents, I think even great-grandchildren, to uh, reach us and to put their stories uh, uh, onto our application. Um, the, the others were very reluctant, and in fact, they completely didn't want to touch in the museum at the opening, uh, because the exhibition was also for three months on in the museum with a lot of... Uh, how to say, exponents and uh, photos and objects and everything what the museum can offer in terms of, uh, how to say, good and, and real palpable and um, real uh, things from the past were put on a very interesting display uh, surrounding the stories which we were telling about the uh, 18 different locations from one neighborhood. They came to the exhibition because everybody which was living in that area, at least, but also some other from the Timishwara area, they were very keen on seeing uh, all of these old bits of history of the city and of the people which lived in that city. Um, but they were so afraid of touching. We had a huge uh, interactive uh, table, interactive display there. They really didn't want to touch it. You know, they were very very reluctant. They looked at the young people, how they are touching and navigating and what they're doing, but not so keen. So that's one of the challenges which we face for the next month. And uh, we have some strategy uh, where we are trying to use, again, students combined with some uh, of our uh, colleagues from NGOs, from the local NGOs, to try to really connect with these people. And we need to remember that not all of them are living now in Timisoara. Quite a lot of them left, usually after the war or during the war. Timishara is well known for 
14, so one four different nationalities living here for more than 300 years. It's considered one of the most multicultural cities of the Central and Eastern Europe. And all of them are, some of them are living all over the world, from, I don't know, United States to Australia and, and Israel and so on. So we really try to connect with the elderly which are living outside and trying to get uh, them to tell the story. So that's one of the challenge where we are trying to involve now not uh, the engineering students, but the students in sociology and anthropology. Thank you very much. That was a really inspiring answer. Yeah, I see another question here, just briefly, if I can answer, if we are planning to share, expand the program to other European capital of culture. Uh, we were discussing this. Uh, we During the 2021, when Timisoara is going to be European capital of culture, uh, Novi Sad is going to be also, which is very near to us. It's less than 120 kilometers far away from us. And we have uh, the discussion exactly about Novi Sad. Yes, thanks, Ladana. Uh, to try to extend them and to even make a parallel because uh, we are all coming somehow from the same region of Europe and to try to see how we can uh, say the same stories, in fact, uh, um, by combining uh, I don't know, maybe happenings and historical facts uh, between us. So we hope so. We, we are looking forward to that. The problem is always a bit of funding. A lot of this, both of these projects, even the DigiCulture, even if it had the European Union uh, funding, that was less than 50% of the effort which was uh, put and even until now, and the project is still running, uh, to, to develop the courses, new courses in 12 different subjects, showcasing more than 300 technologies is not easy to be to be done and not cheap to be honest also and the same with this to have a website a mobile app uh, in all uh, in also in ios and android and to be able to have augmented reality and to have in location exhibition to have museum exhibition it's not coming cheap and it's been done quite a lot with uh, luck in fact completely with local effort from our university, from the museum and the association of Team Shara 2021. Well, thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Diana. And also, thank you for the, the questions in our chat. We'll have more opportunities for more questions as we go on. Just, just before I pass over to our next uh, speaker, I'd like to make the most of the, uh, the last slide that Diana has very kindly put up for us here. Um, remind you about our in 2020 annual conference, which is going to be taking place in Timisoara in uh, towards the end of June. And I think after the wonderful presentation by Diana of the uh, of the work they're doing, I, I really can't encourage you enough to uh, um, to uh, come into our conference and meet some of the people who've worked on this and, and participate in the in the whole uh, Eden experience. So thank you very much, Diana. My pleasure. So, Welcome to Timisoara. <laughs> absolutely. Okay, so I'd like to pass over to our third speaker, Javier Atenas, who's uh, at the Open Education Policy Lab, also a, a member of the Open Education Working Group, which has got a very large experience in, in the area that we're, we're covering in this webinar. And uh, finally, she's also a researcher at the University of, uh, of uh, Barcelona. So Javier, if you can uh, switch on your webcam, you have your, your presentation, and uh, the floor, as they say, is, is all yours. Hi, uh, thanks for, for inviting me and happy uh, um, Open Education Week. I uh, hope you can hear me. Um, hi from London. It's pretty cold up here. Uh, I think there's another storm coming. Uh, what I want to talk today and following, uh, following up what Alfredo and, and Diana uh, talked about is about how to do civic engagement from, but from another perspective. Uh, okay, you can see me. I think there. I think now it's working. Sorry for that. Um, what what I want to talk about today is how we are developing some strategies, mostly with the Open Education Working Group and with all the little projects I'm, I'm working on at the moment, about uh, civic engagement and democracy through um, mostly open data. Open data is any kind of data that's been released in the open by governments or uh, scientific groups. Uh, scientists also release data quite often, international organizations like the United Nations or the Inter-American Development Bank or the uh, World Bank, they release data. And this data can be used 
to sort out uh, challenges that students can work with with teachers. Um, so when we talk about open education and citizenship, from my my own perspective, um, is that open education can contribute to develop citizenship by working with students or, or actually bringing challenges from, from, from the society into the university, into the schools. So how do we develop training materials and open educational resources that can help to challenge and to understand society problems? Um, one of the examples and one of the things I personally work mostly on is how to use open data as open educational resources. One, one of the interesting bits of, of, of open data, and when you think about the kind of literacies that you need to develop when you work with data, are related with um, new skills. Uh, and one, um, it's quite interesting what Diana was talking about, the citizenship and uh, competences framework for, for literacy. Um, solving real life issues, that issues that are connected with your reality, with what you do every day with the problems of, of your local community. It doesn't need to be a global issue, but with your local community, it is something interesting. And as a, using a bit of the open science approach to teaching and learning using open educational resources. So uh, despite understanding that data is never raw, data always has a component of um, culture where the data has been collected on, um, you can bring the data to the classroom and use this data to challenge students, to challenge their perception, actually using and, and recalling on what Alfredo was talking about, um, ethics of, of pedagogy. So how to embed ethical principles in, in the pedagogy to sort out uh, daily life challenges. So if we think of uh, what you can find on resources for OER, for um, citizenship and democracy, there is no man, there's no many. I was um, looking at different projects during the weekend when I was preparing the presentation and I couldn't find many OERs uh, in, in general about uh, uh, human rights or peace education, except for um, OER Commons that has a section for open education, that there is a lack of materials. Of course, there is plenty of research and, and plenty of handbooks and booklets that you can work with. Um, UNESCO has a great collection, uh, but how do we teach human rights or how do we teach education for, for the peace or um, gender equality? If we can present students with challenges they may be able to, to solve by giving them, for example, data challenges and, and or data expeditions. So I was looking at some interesting projects, mostly at European level, uh, instead of, of, of where to find resources. It's where, in this case, it would be mostly like where to find techniques where you can bring the data into, into the classroom. Uh, one, of, one of the most interesting projects that I've met in the, in the last few years is as uh, Monitor Uh They work with open data uh, during during civic monitoring. So someone presents a problem, for example, in how how the money is being spent, uh, European money, for example, European funds, and citizens uh, go and try to solve this challenge by analyzing the data. Um, this is this is uh, a group founded by, by academics and, and advocates in, in Italy, um, where they propose challenges for people to resolve. So how the money is being spent, how um, funds have been allocated, where, where the money is. Uh, and people try to find solutions to problems and how to better, better spend some money, for example, uh, by, by working with, with open data. The, most of the data comes from the, port, the portal of uh, uh, national national affairs. Um, it's, it's, they have a national portal for data, and most of the uh, European countries, but now nowadays mostly mo most of the countries have 
national data portal. Those data portals um, normally are opened up through the transparency laws, and actually uh, you can request data if you cannot find it through freedom of information. So it's, it's kind of easy to, to get data. So, but a spin-off of Monitoring Italy is the School of Open Cohesion, uh, the School of Open Cohesion in Italy. Uh, these guys are doing a fantastic, fantastic work with secondary schools in Italy. They use basically the same protocol of um, civic monitoring, but through challenges on schools. So every year uh, there is an open call for, for schools to present projects where they want to resolve um, local issues using um, national data. Uh, some schools get selected and then the teachers get training on data literacy so they can pass this new knowledge into students. There is a mini MOOC for, for teachers uh, to, um, to learn and also for designing activities. So curriculum design is really important and, and, and in this case because the activities need to be very well designed so students can resolve them. Curriculum design and ethics around it. It's, it's quite quite key and so the students work with a uh, complex data set so we're talking about students from 16 to 19 years old um, and they work with data in in, in a way that um, they solve local problems and then once the problem is solved or resolved um, they communicate this information using a citizen science approach they just um, write a report, they send it to the local authorities, they try to meet with the local authorities and um, they do a presentation, can be a board or, or, or a chart box where people can go and look at the information, they have a website where people outside the school community can look into the project and once th those that have um, made the, the, the projects get, get, get an award, but the students learn to communicate the results using, for example, uh, data journalism techniques, which uh, it, 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 it's an available skill, it's an available way to communicate uh, results from, from data analysis. So they have dashboards and they learn how to do data visualizations, and once they have, they communicate um, they, they communicate with, 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 with the local authorities and uh, whichever other relevant um, uh, unit can, can, can be found. For example, some, some contact the local newspapers or the local radio. They do videos for YouTube presenting the results of the study. Um, another way to uh, promote citizenship uh, using open educational resources or open educational practices is also to engage with discussions at the level of open government partnership. Um, I've been quite involved in few instances of um, developing small um, national commitments or assessing or evaluating national commitments on open education. Uh, interestingly, one of the first ones to have a national commitment in open education uh, through the Open Government Partnership, which, if you don't know what it is, is basically a coalition of countries promoting openness, transparency, and um, reliability of, of how they manage the governance. So it's openness and transparency are um, core principles for Open Government Partnerships. So it's not about just transparency and accountability at an uh, economical level. It's also fostering participation uh, from, from, the, uh, from the citizens, um, including um, stuff like uh, citizen budgets or developing capacities in the communities, on the local communities for understanding open data or freedom of information uh, laws. So people, so there are some, a set of national commitments where countries uh, pledge to, not only communicate but also promote and endorse good practices in open data and freedom of information. Um, so one of the first countries that developed uh, some national commitments was Romania. And they pledged to 
open up a teaching and learning resources through a national uh, library of open educational resources. Also, Greece has a commitment on have, in opening up materials for uh, higher education. But one interesting talking about um, uh, citizenship and democracy, it's that Chile has pledged in the last two years to develop a curricula and open educational resources to train uh, citizenship. What is, why is interesting this is because um, uh, civic education, the program of civic education got canceled by the government. Um, the government decided to take it off the curriculum a few years ago. Now, in a way to re implement and to relearn how um, to understand the society, uh, the National Library of the Congress has split to develop um, OERs and online teaching materials and an online curriculum and maybe an online course um, uh, to um, foster citizenship through open education. That includes also open data. Uh, one of the interesting things so when you work with open government partnership, it's not, it's not just the government that makes the commitments. It's, you can find out who's working on commitments at, in your own country and to advocate a civil society, for example, or, or as academics of a group of academics to have embedded or design a national curriculum in the upcoming um, a national action plan. So um, Spain had had one that didn't went through, but it, it, it was there at least, they, they, at least they tried. Chile has one now, Romania has one. So maybe a way to promote um, civic, uh, civic or citizenship is is engaging with the open government partnership in in your in your country. Uh, uh, in this case, because it's, there's no much about um, there are no many resources where I can say okay, you should look at this or you should look at that into literacies for um, uh, citizenship and democracy. Uh, there are some readings that I might like to, to recommend you. Um, how to develop uh, open education um, resources that are sustainable. Uh, perspective from, from the Global South, from Ashley Canwar. It's kind of the core resources when you're trying to design um, materials that are sustainable uh, for all the communities. Um, my colleague Leo Haveman and I have been working quite a lot on how to use open data as open educational resources. Um, so there's plenty of open access um, papers that we've both published. Um, when we talked about um, how to use open government data, open data for teaching and learning, uh, one of the founders of uh, Monitor Italy, uh, Luigi Reggi, has published um, a paper about promoting the use of open government data for training and engagement. So that's a reading. Um, this of course open access, so you can access it. Um, there is a book on uh, open education and education for openness, uh, which is how to um, create materials that can be adopted by others and kind of engaging with development of open educational resources. Uh, of course, we have, as Leo and I have published in cases of, of emerging practice on, on how to use open data so you can get inspired on how to use data, um, how to use data uh, for, for teaching and learning, how to use open data. And finally, if you want to engage a more at a political level for, for developing or for engaging with your students or with your university into making your country to, to commit uh, for open education and open citizenship and in political engagement and participation. Uh, there is a paper by Jan Gondol and Nicole Allen on how open government can be a platform for, for advancing open education. So if you have any questions here, I'm here to answer. Um, just, just let me know. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting, uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, presentation. Um, well, you've, you've already got a question in the um, which is a question I'm reading as I'm speaking here. 
Yeah, um, I'm reading uh, Alexandra's uh, comment. Um, yeah, also I forgot to mention, that was my bad, uh, <laughs> uh, School of Data. In School of Data, Alexandra and everyone, uh, is the key resource for learning or for start working with students on how to use open data uh, to engage in uh, data literacy. Uh, I, my bad, I've been working for, with them for years. I completely forgot to put them on, on, on the list, so I will add them later. Um, yes, the School of Data, and the beautiful thing of School of Data is they have translated materials into many languages. So there is in French, there is in, in, it, in, in Spanish, they have in, in Portuguese, and also they have materials in, in English, of course. So yeah, um, if you want to start working with your students and doing data expeditions and stuff like that, um, let's have a conversation and have a look in, uh, for on, on School of Data resources. Thank you very much, uh, Javier. One thing that, that occurs to me is that um, I think for people who aren't used to moving around in the, in the world of data, be it closed or open, it can be a bit intimidating. I mean, do you think that uh, ordinary people can realistically expect to connect to an open government website and extract the information that they could actually use in a meaningful way without going crazy in the process? Uh, no. <laughs> it, it's quite difficult for someone. <laughs> I have to be honest in here. Um, you need to be data literated in a way. Uh, you need to be able to understand and to assess and to gather the data that you need. That's why working with students and also it at an interdisciplinary challenges is so, so interesting. You have students that are studying or people that are studying or know about um, information structure. So you have librarians that can help you to gather the data, to organize your data. Uh, then you have the School of Statistics that can help you to analyze the data. So you have... Um, you, ha you cannot do it as, as a alone citizen if you are not data literate. Uh, you, you need to work with a group of, of people. That could be your neighbors, that could be your community, that could be your students. Uh, but yes, I, I completely agree, uh, Maria Rosaria, that we, we really need to, to, to promote the development of, of data literacy in formal and informal context. Uh, uh, we we're talking now, these days, about the data fight society. People need to understand data, um, whether they like it or not. We produce, we're producing data. We, we do data all the time. Uh, students produce data. They are assessed through the data that they produce. Uh, if we look at what the universities do with uh, learning analytics, it's data analysis. So the students don't even know how to relate to the data they produced. So we, I, think, I think it's core to start thinking and also if my government is publishing the budget on an open data portal and I'm incapable to understand, I'm incapable to participate. So I think it's, it's a responsibility for our schools and universities and national programs and curriculum development to start thinking about not only open data, but the political bits of, of data. And data needs to be used as, as OER. It's, it's there, it's available. It's, now we need to start taking advantage of it. Yeah, I, I think that's very good. Um, can I just turn the question around? Because, I mean, if you like, we're trying to inculcate in younger people the importance to be able to detect fake news that's, uh, that's appearing these days. I mean, just seeing something on the internet doesn't make it right. I mean, I think we need to extend that slightly and to be able to detect fake news based in data. Yeah. Because it's quite easy to pull statistics out of the air and make it quite a convincing argument. I mean, how do you think we, we could go along with go along with sort of helping people begin to develop a skill or an, at least an intuition to be able to spot fake use of data? Well, uh, when, when I was teaching, last time I was teaching, I was teaching a course on uh, data literacy at, at, at master's level, and I used to carry the newspapers with me every single class. So what we used to do is like, okay, we're going to look for statistics in the news, like in a random news, and try to find the source of, of that news. And then if for example, if it's National Institute of Statistics or the um, International Health Organization or UNICEF, because nobody is about migration and pandemics and epidemics and stuff like that, actually where the money is spent, you can look into this data because UNICEF or the United Nations, the World Bank, or they, they kind of have the data or similar data. So um, you ask the students uh, to validate 
the, the statistic and also to validate the, the method or the statistical method used to analyze the data. Uh, because they put in average everything, was actually the average most of the time doesn't work. So it's also yep. a bit of like connecting if they're using the right statistical method to assess the right, the correct data and if how much they are manipulating it. But yeah, the newspapers are the best friends to, to do that work. Okay, that's, that's good. If you like, it validates the role of newspapers in our modern society because sometimes I think that they're concerned that we're moving away from them as sources of information and just looking for stuff on, on by, our, by ourselves. Okay, well, I think there are other questions, but I'll, I'll ask everyone just to be, to be patient. We're coming to the end of your time for questions and we'll have some more time at the end. It was a very, very provoking and, and interesting uh, presentation. So I think now I'd like to pass over to our, our last speaker. Um, Beatriz uh, Sedano, who's a research associate at UNED, a colleague of mine here in Spain. And um, ask you, may I to, that's it, just like the camera and pass the word over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here at this time of the afternoon and for staying for my presentation. And thank you to, to the speakers for your insightful presentations. Uh, very interesting stuff has coming up. Um, I'm going to present uh, um, a project called Nexus because it's related with the topic of the webinar today. Uh, because this project is focused on open and digital civic education. Uh, you can see here um, the complete name, the full name of the project. Uh, that is promoting the nexus of migrants through active citizenship. Um, and this project uh, started uh, at, the, at, the, at the end of last year. So it's, we are early in, a, we are still in an early stage of the project and will be finished in 2022. It's an Erasmus project. And you can see our brand new logo here. Um, I'm going to present very briefly the partners because um, for this project is, is important because we have a very diverse consortium, consortium uh, because uh, for this topic it's, uh, it's important to reach a wide cultural diversity of population, of student population. So we have a combination of um, universities and non-profit uh, organizations and even a, a company focused on, on digital innovation. We have uh, among the higher education institutions, we have um, universities with uh, very diverse um, students profile and using open education such as UNED in Spain, the Spanish Distance Learning University and UNIMED in Italy that is the Mediterranean uh, Universities Union with more than uh, 2,015 universities. It's an association of universities. Uh, also, we have another university, Malmo University, that is, is, uh, has a lot of um, specific experience, including civic education in higher education. Together with uh, Non-profit organizations such as IRE, uh, Institute for Development uh, of Education in Croatia, uh, with big experience in uh, developing higher education policies. We have ICAS, European Citizen Action Service, based in Brussels, Belgium, with uh, a lot of experience in digital democracy, and uh, APIS. Uh, based in Slovenia that has uh, a non-profit uh, organization um, focused on art for social change. They have um, a lot of experience uh, with uh, intercultural perspective and social inclusion. And finally, we have Knowledge Innovation Center based in Malta well, uh, with a lot of experience in uh, open education and digital innovation in higher education. Well, so before we, um, we go on with Nexus, um, I would like to talk about 
uh, our previous experience um, very briefly in another project with, where some of the partners uh, participated, where we also identified some needs for this new project, for Nexus. This project was uh, Moonlight uh, that uh, finished last year uh, in September in 2019 and was focused on um, curating and developing MOOCs for refugee and migrants to help them with the language competencies for employability and social inclusion. And, for example, in UNED, uh, in Spain, we developed uh, some MOOCs for, uh, to learn Spanish as a language, uh, as a foreign language, and they were focusing on immediate, uh, immediate needs, just like going to the doctor, looking for a house, doing paperwork. And also, we included transversal skills, such as uh, how to talk and uh, how to, ma uh, to behave in a job interview, but also uh, because, as um, Diana was talking, we involved in the target audience uh, into the design of the courses. They, they were uh, some students, uh, refugee and migrants themselves. They were the actors for the videos for the courses, and and they help us uh, also with the uh, with some uh, local um, NGOs. We we help us deciding the topics of, for the course. And one of the, for example, one uh, of the main topics they wanted to learn was how to defend their rights. So we realize this is uh, very related with um, where we are talking uh, today about about being an active citizen. And with this project, we, we learned that w once uh, migrants uh, reach a certain level of language competence, like B1, B2, uh, they also want to be uh, part of the community and be uh, engaged, be active citizens. So we thought um, a project to move a step forward uh, into social inclusion and civic education was also needed. Um, and this is uh, uh, what is Nexus focus on. Um, here, um, I added a, a definition of uh, civic education that maybe there is not need because the previous presenters they they talk about this, but it's related uh, basically to the resources for being an active citizen. Uh, so, um, given the increasing cultural diversity of the student population in, in higher education institutions, uh, there is a growing need to provide students of different origins with a more global perspective of what is to be a citizen in their host countries, and also what are the benefits of being uh, socially uh, active uh, in the digital world. Therefore, the uh, aims, uh, the main uh, objectives of Nexus are, are these, these, um, these ones. First, to empower students, especially uh, migrants, to exercise their rights and contribute to the society and global community. And uh, also a crucial aspect of this project is to the exploration of the relationship between digital uh, participatory tools and democracy. So one of the objectives is to explore the tools available for this, together with um, the, uh, to provide open learning uh, for uh, students uh, in order to become active citizens. Um, this is in line, um, we can say that this is in line with uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 4 for quality, for inclusive, sorry, and quality education. And if you look to the uh, goal, no, 4-7, um, it's focused also on promotes uh, education on human rights, um, global citizenship, cultural diversity, etc., at all levels, not only for the students, but also for uh, in educational 
policies, curricula, and teacher education. So, what are the activities planned for, for this project? We are, as I said, in an early state, but we are already carrying out some of the activities. The first one is, um, well, as Javier pointed out, there are some, but not many, open educational resources on this topic of uh, uh, civic education and open democracy. So the first um, activity is uh, developing a MOOC on civic education for students with a, mig a migrant background. Obviously, it's, uh, it's, gonna, it's going to be a MOOC, so it will be open for everyone, but it, it will be focused on this target audience. And it will be a structure uh, based on e micro learning units, which means that it will be uh, following a modular and flexible methodology where uh, students can choose the units they want to study. Yep. Uh, and also, uh, as Diana explained for, for the uh, digital cultural project, we will try to involve the target audience, as we did also in the Moonlight project, in the creation of materials, uh, etc. We are now with the analysis of this core of this MOOC needs. Uh, we have launched a questionnaire in our institutions to gain a better understand it understand it uh, of this uh, of the students with migrant background uh, what are their expectations needs uh, topics to be addressed in the courses on this uh, on digital civic education and citizen citizenship and then when uh, we will start very soon with the curriculum design the course development and the implementation after that, um, a knowledge sharing platform um, built also with open educational resources uh, for civic educators will be de developed. Uh, it will be focused on migrations, in, in, on migration, sorry, on how um, social inclusion needs of migrant students can be addressed, and also with guidelines. Uh, for higher education institutions on student civic engagement. We will try to include application scenarios, activi practical activities. Um, and this platform we uh, will be uh, tested, uh, and there will be some exchange of, of the experiences. Um, other activity of the project uh, is focused on community engagement and service learning for integration and inclusion, um, focus on also on uh, migrant uh, students. Um, currently, desk research on this topic is being conducted, identifying service learning practices and community engagement with migrants uh, here in, in and outside Europe. And then uh, after the desk research, there will be a deep analysis and uh, a document with guidelines for institutions will be uh, developed um, on um, how to offer for new arrived migrant students civic engagement and service learning. And also some of the strategies included in the guidelines will be pilot in, the, in some partners' institutions. And finally, uh, among the activities, um, also, because we are talking about digital uh, civic education, an inventory of digital tools for open democracy and digital citizenship will be compiled. Uh, it's already, uh, this activity has already started. And uh, also, there will be, a, together with this inventory, a handbook for educators, educators uh, on how to use these tools. Um, and uh, this inventory will be interactive. Um, and um, it will be helping both educators and students to understand how to use these uh, 16 uh, digital tools in order to participate in society. Um, for example, I only add 
one example because there are several tools, many tools uh, that that will be included in the inventory. But you can see here an example that is uh, Civic Tech, that is a platform, a project where um, which compiles uh, Civic uh, Tech initiatives where uh, technology is used for the public good. So there is uh, here you can see the, the home page where you can see the map with the uh, initiatives. And uh, it compiles initiatives uh, from public uh, policy, political campaigns, also um, urban planification. There are uh, many, many uh, initiatives. And also, um, another example that I didn't, it's not here, but I can add at the chat, uh, for example, this one that is from no, European Commission, is an European Commission initiative to propose an initiative, a new initiative, uh, and uh, to get support on that initiative. So this is just two examples of uh, tools that can be in this inventory and how to, to use them. And um, that's it. Uh, we, we don't have uh, our um, website ready yet. We are going to, it's under preparation. But if you have, if you want more information on the activities and outputs, uh, you can send us an email to me or also to Timothy, that is uh, also coordinator in this project at UNED. Thank you very much, Mary Cliff. I think that's an interesting uh, presentation. It will be interesting um, over the next uh, thank you very much uh, couple of years seeing what actually uh, concretely comes out of the out of the, the project. I think it's quite interesting if if you reflect on um, on the motivation of the European Commission in funding these sorts of, of projects. I mean, at the end of the day, they want us to be more integrated and have the sense of being European. But it's not always easy what that really means. And if you think of people coming into the uh, European, European zone from outside of Europe, and obviously you're thinking about basic social inclusion, language skills, finding jobs, etc. But then as you've got to get over those sorts of initial hurdles, you think about, if you like, uh, slightly more intangible but uh, equally important skills of, of becoming a um, good citizen and developing the, the, civic, uh, the civic skills in this um, in this area. And of course, one, one difficulty I think uh, talking to you in the past has, has highlighted, if you like, is the, the, the basic level of skills that people need to be able to be actively involved in, in civic uh, um, activities. For example, language skills, because in the previous project we were talking about in Moonlet, um, we were working with refugees and migrants and we were helping them to get up to A2 on the, uh, the, the common European framework of reference of languages. And really, for participation in this sort of project, one of the reasons we're focusing on students in higher education is because we need better skills. We need them to have a high B1 or a B2. I mean, what's your opinion? I know it's just been running, hasn't been run for long, you haven't had a lot of time to reflect on this, but what's your opinion on the other kinds of skills that the students would really need to be able to become active citizens as the European Commission might like? Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, apart from the uh, language skills that obviously, as you said, they are obvious, uh, also they they should have, I think, basic digital skills, yes, uh, in order to to be able of uh, participate in, in these, uh, for example, resources or MOOC. Because as we, um, as you also could see in the Moonlight project, uh, most of the um, migrants uh, arriving, for example, in our country, uh, they didn't have the um, digital skills to uh, to make to to do a MOOC. So what we did uh, is to provide more uh, scaffolding 
pedagogical and, and technological uh, scaffolding on these courses. Um, so yeah. I think for these courses, uh, maybe uh, students participating yeah, should have um, basic. Uh, I think it's something we can almost um, take for granted these days with most of uh, the sorts of students that we uh, we come across. At least yeah. at university level, students that have previous skill in this um, in this uh, area. Um, one final uh, question for you, and then um, if you like, I'll open up the floor to our uh, other presenters and and see if we've got some issues we can talk about in general, is uh, I think what fits in really nicely with this um, this project, or could fit in nicely, was the framework that Alfredo presented at the very beginning. Um, because the mm -hmm. problem that I see here with this work is that we need some kind of uh, tool to be able to measure the engagement. Because from a scientific perspective, if we want to undertake research and show that we're actually uh, causing um, students to become more active and to participate in, in events, then we need, if you like, a framework to actually say, well, look, these are the competences that, that they should be using in these uh, particular activities. Can we detect evidence of these uh, um, competences being being used? And if that's the case, how can we you know, move on and present other more advanced activities to actually sort of cascade the development of their understanding and skills? I mean, how do you see that actually working in reality? Yeah, that's true. I think um, it will be a bit uh, difficult to measure how they're going to become uh, real active <laughs> in their real communities. I mean, we can measure uh, what they actually actually learned uh, with no? within the MOOC and the real and the different activities. But uh, I think yes, I think it, it would be very interesting to use this. Uh, Framework that Alfredo presented, or at least okay. uh, adapted. Thank you very much. I mean, we're coming into the, the final this straight of this um, of this webinar. Uh, we got sort of about four or five ish minutes exactly. left. So what I would ask my um, colleagues to do would be to please share your your webcam so we can have you all together in the in the final uh, few minutes. And um, I'd like to ask you, in a way, for your reflections, perhaps a bit of a, a provocative question, yeah. but. Uh, we kind of, being educators, perhaps we're a little um, naive in this sense. We automatically assume that if we start um, to do something, there'll be nothing um, there mm -hmm. trying to stop us from, from achieving that. And, and uh, I think it's an, a worthy goal that we should try and use open ed education for the civic engagement and democracy. But what I wonder is uh, up to what point is there interest on the part of governments that we actually can achieve this open democracy, if you like? Because if you think about some of the... Uh, the, the, the changes that governments have had to uh, face in the, the, in the, or the, the resistance they're, they're feeling in, the, in the, the past few years. I can think of Brexit, I can think of what's happening in, in France with the pensions, I can think of other examples which I'm, I'm not going to go into now. If you like, you're entering into a, uh, a bit of a conflict between direct democracy, our right to be heard and to influence, and representative democracy. Because, I mean, you know, a few decades ago we elected a, a, a uh, politician to represent us, and in the worst case, I was really upset. I might write a letter complaining and say, "Please bring up this point because I'm not happy with it," and that would be that. And the politicians would pretty much do what they want to. I mean, my open question for my my colleague presenters is: Do you think that we can actually produce a change and improve society and make people civically more act active um, by following the lines of research that we're, we're actually doing? Don't all answer at once. <laughs> well, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, yes. No, sorry, I just want to say something very briefly. Okay. That is, Alfredo? Yes, because the first step is to give in you know, the tools to be active. So yeah, I think we can educate. Um, not. Our students, we cannot change governments or something <laughs> like that. Uh, I'm not Che Guevara, for instance. But um, uh, I think that we, we, we can educate at least our students the right way. And I think that we, if we try to give them examples like we have seen in presentations and uh, 
uh, try to 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 uh, let's say try to give them the right uh, perspectives on these uh, competencies. Uh, we, I think we did our job. Uh, that, that's our area of influence, and we can do that job. Um, I, I would like to see more of these uh, courses online, which if you look for it, you don't find these courses. I'm talking about courses, real courses with learning outcomes and assessment and even badges and things like that. Uh, I think that even, for instance, in the next conference in Timisoara, I think that we probably can get some commitment for, for some of the participants in, in providing these courses. We need these courses to get a bigger audience. Uh, in terms of uh, what we are discussing tonight, today. I think that's an excellent. Uh, also, um, I think it, 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 we need to, to look into um, the role of the, the public universities in developing citizenship. Uh, the, the, the issue uh, with the marketization of, of, of public universities and that the, the focus is only just competing for the rankings, leaving behind the, the role of, of, of developing a society and contributing to the ethics of the society, uh, it, it's key. So we need to go back and rethink what is the role of the university is not just competing for getting a higher level in, in the ranking, it's, it's to develop local communities and, and, and local democracy. I, th I think this is something that we all need to start looking. I think you're right. And very finally, Diana, would you like to write something, please? Uh, yes, uh, just briefly. Um, in fact, I just wrote down uh, because I came across uh, some amazing, uh, how to say, examples of uh, how you can use um, art, culture, and even digital tools uh, for active engagement. And maybe this is something which you should also look into on the digital competencies and how to use art for uh, active citizenship, especially for mi migrants. And I put there uh, an example which I found it astonishing. For example, Brian McCormack was showing this last week in Rome, and uh, they are um, using uh, art uh, in, to involve children to open up and speak about their experiences. So they give uh, uh, a piece of uh, paper and some uh, some colored crayons to the children and they start drawing their examples and then they start discussing about that and, and offering some support. And you can see over the time how the drawings are changing of the same child and it's amazing. And this is really opened up quite a lot of the migrants which are uh, in, uh, in South Italy to speak about uh, their issues, and it was a very powerful tool uh, to be shown by the by the Italian and European uh, government and the European Commission on uh, how to how what the experience in fact of a migrant. So um, combining art culture can be good for sit active citizenship, and because uh, you know I'm a very strong uh, promoter of using properly technology. I think uh, by using some technology, uh, it's really more, how to say, more more interesting on on becoming an active citizen. You show the courses for uh, a school of data, which is very popular, but very few people know. And exactly this is what we were doing with our students and, and the high school uh, pupils. We show them how open data, creative commons works, and how they can be really uh, active by by using it and and uh, challenging uh, institutions and schools and education for this. So I think this was a very good uh, webinar on trying to put together some ideas for others to to use it and to and to to become more active. In fact, we are all citizens of this world and we need to take action and we need to use any possibility to do that. And our job as higher educators. Uh, people working in higher education is to encourage students and show them how they can do it and encourage them to do it in the future and uh, also while they are uh, with us uh, in our university. That's our role, and I strongly believe that. Wonderful. I think that's a very positive and inspiring note to, to finish this uh, webinar. And I'd like to thank all of our presenters for, for having been here today and also the participants, and as I said before, you'll have a copy of this um, 
uh, webinar online which you can watch or you can pass to people who haven't been able to uh, participate in it and also the slides will be on, on SlideShare. And also please remember that the um, Eden's participation in the Open Education Week hasn't finished yet. We've got a, a webinar tomorrow at um, 1 o'clock CET on unboxing the textbook for an open world and on Friday another one at the same time on microlearning and quality um, for lifelong learning in the, in the digital age. So I, I'd highly encourage you to uh, attend and participate in both events. Thank you very much indeed. Bye.